Ja. Okay. Right. So, a warm welcome to all of you who have chosen to spend your time with us and um, share and learn and contribute to a better world. I would like to welcome you in a word that um, would not be as bad as it was last year when I introduced this meeting, but unfortunately, I think we are even worse. Um, <coughs> a huge part of the population is actually getting um, more food insecure for every day that passes. So in time like this, it's quite grim, actually. I think it's so important, it's even more to important to come together, uh, raise problems, discuss them, share our knowledge, find possible solution, build new collaboration and join hands. And that's what we're going to do today. Um, while outside I read a World Bank report uh, on the inflation that remains high and the highest of the inflation goods is actually food. 70% of the countries reported higher inflation and food prices. And uh, you know also that uh, Gaza Strip, according to the integrated food security phase uh, classification, is facing an alarming, catastrophic level of food insecurity. And uh, that was before the boycott now. Conflicts, macroeconomic crisis, climate events continue to be main, main drivers for this. And even here in Sweden on the news yesterday, it was like we would last for three days if anyone would come up with an idea to boycott Sweden. So we don't really have a really solid food system here as well. It can be much better. Yeah. But we also see from the last years that there are positive signs because, because of all these multiple crises accumulating all over the world, we manage to keep up our trade routes. We have international trade. People are adapting to those challenges. They are adapting to climate change. And this is really important. And we also have learned that we see food security and agriculture production in a holistic system. It's a system, a food system, and the countries are adapting to that as well. So they start to collaborate between sectors which they have not been before. There are national pathways on how to deal with the food system because in the UN, food system is seen as a key to achieve the SDGs and also some of the climate goals. So this is recognized. Food system was also brought up and highlighted during COP28, and we will see more of that. So this is the system is taking on. And in the Kunming Montreal Agreement or Convention, biodiversity restoration is now a global concern and will come into our work and make our work even more important. So um, <coughs> we are also, we are also in realizing how important it is to have resilient local food systems as well as the global one. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm soon to start, but you might come to this meeting and say, what happens in these meetings? So 2023, we had a meeting. It was on the other part of the city and <coughs> we came, oh, sorry. Uh, so we had some statements by the end of the day, and this is exactly what we are working with. So we continue to be a platform for building knowledge, sharing through dialogues, informing policy and public debate for innovative, sustainable transformation of food system. It's exactly what we have been doing and trying to do all through the year. And we are trying to bridge actors and building and spreading knowledge uh, and bringing new perspectives. Uh, this is what we are doing, we're doing here, we continue to do so all through the years. We started last year to work with our theory of change, uh, where um, we like to see uh, change, sustainable food system that are equal for all and especially for young people, for indigenous people and women. And then also, <clears throat> so what was brought up as we should really try to deal with and did we do 
some of that. So it was exemplified that we should explore new topics like water, agriculture and food, conflict and food systems. And we have taken that on in seminars at least three last years as an expert group on food security and, uh, and conflict starting up. Um, we should pilot multi-stakeholder projects. We are starting up four uh, multi-stakeholder, multi-sector expert groups um, and trying to break these silos. We are highlighting examples of interesting food system transformation through our very vibrant and very interesting website. So you can read a lot of the system you are sharing there. Um, we try to adapt a bottom-up approach and empowering people. And you will see example of that, how we empower and amplify voices. You will see it through the network, to, uh, through the, our session today. And we try to communicate around our funding opportunities. And our that's where we share on LinkedIn. And our LinkedIn has, I don't know, doubled and tripled the attendance has grown Im amazingly and I think it's because we are actually sharing from all of you opportunities. Um, yeah, and support living labs and that is also what we will do through our expert groups and other activities linked to the expert group. This was my very short introduction, I think I'm already over time, but now I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague Jonna who will uh, Jonna and Ebba, please take the stage. Thank you, man. Bara. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. Nice to meet you all. I'll take this. And uh, my name is Jonna. I work with Siani since last year in June. Uh, so I've been here for around six months now, and I work as a project coordinator at Siani. And uh, I'm Ebba, and I've been working with Siani for about two weeks. Uh, I'm an intern, so yeah, I'm very new, uh, but it's been really fun. Yeah, so it's really nice. It's both of our first annual Siani meeting, and we're very excited. And it says that I will introduce the participants, but I think that you will have plenty of opportunities during the day to introduce yourselves to each other. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to like... Uh, present all of you, but what we will do is that we will do a menti to uh, see a little bit about how the Siani network here in Sweden also has links uh, globally. So you can go to menti.com or use that uh, QR code. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, you, yeah. You have to pick one, because it's not possible to uh, put many dots on the map. So I will go to this and then... Yeah, so you can choose either... No, sorry. Oh, either the last place, uh, the country you're working with, or one of your favorites. Uh, there was a limitation to only choose one, so... Yeah, it's just fun to see the sp like how spread... Uh, how many countries? Uh, Let's see if up. there are some dots coming. No, it's quite difficult, <laughs> but you do your best. <laughs> At least we can see the regions, maybe, where... <laughs> yeah. I'll stand on this side, I think. <laughs> so there are some dots coming up, and we can see that it's quite spread. We have some group here in uh, Asia, East Africa, but also other parts of Africa is there. And uh, what do you think, Eva? How is, does it look on that towards that side? Yeah, we have in Brazil, and then I see somewhere along central. Uh, America. It's hard to see exactly which <laughs> country, because <laughs> it's so small. <laughs> I don't know if it's still, if we are still getting um, answers, but uh, this is one way to at least uh, visualize a little bit the, the CRN network and how we are uh, actually, uh, yeah, reaching many parts of the world. Uh, 
Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you can so if you, you haven't filled in, continue, and uh, maybe at the end of the day we will have even more dots. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So thank you so much, Yuna and Eva, for this, and and we'll see. You can keep up when you find your t uh, cell phone. You just put in and and get uh, the uh, your dots in. Um, yeah, f so in this little small group in this room, we reach out quite well and have connections and networks in these regions. Now, we will have presentations um, around food systems, urban and rural. And we do so because uh, by the end of this year, there will be a UN report on uh, rural and urban food systems. But of course, we will start in the rural food system where the food is produced. And uh, I'm so pleased and honored to be able to introduce to you Markus Lana, who is the senior lecturer at the Department of Crop Production Ecology at SLU. But he's also the general for uh, the Agroecology Europe. And um, we'll talk about agroecology as an approach to design sustainable food system. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you very much, Madeleine. Uh, good. Just a minute, sorry, LM International, like of Hunan. Will you be able to share these presentations because they're super interesting? I'm certain about that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, everything is filmed, so it will be on YouTube as well. Now you know everyone. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> I think I will use this one. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, uh, Madeleine. Twelve minutes. Okay. <laughs> uh, good. As you know, I'm from FLU. That's my main institution. I'm also part of Agroecology Europe, which is based in Brussels. I'm here to talk about food systems and also the connection with agroecology. This is pretty obvious. What can be a food system is like from from few to fork and so on. There are different components of it. And and when I started to work, uh, I was only looking at the agricultural part, only at the production part, and then. With time, I, I understand that actually we are part of a bigger thing. Uh, and actually, we have uh, some major challenges, and some of them are, like, as always, ensuring food production, and not only food. Nowadays, we have to also produce fuel, fiber, ecosystem services. We need to support livelihoods. Farming is also an activity, a social activity, is a job, is an occupation is a livelihood. Eh? And on top of that, we need to be sure that we keep the environmental integrity, or at least that we conserve the natural uh, resources so that we can keep existing. When we talk about food systems, uh, then yesterday I, I found this very interesting figure. It's called the illusion of choice, but I also give it the name uh, the food empire. We believe that, oh yeah, there are so many different brands and options to choose from, but actually there are very few players in here. And when we start to look at the raw products, like the soybean uh, or the grains that are being produced, uh, the number of players is reduced even more. We have DM, Cargill and some other very few players that are dominating the food chain from the production until the consumption. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about one example. I was part of this many, many years ago uh, about the landless workers movement. Uh, we, uh, many of you probably heard about it, uh, maybe good things, maybe bad things, maybe horrible things. Uh, but w l let's look a little bit uh, how uh, about the trajectory. It started in 84, I was three years old at that time, was not even aware of this obviously. And they had uh, different goals, but very important for them, access to land. Brazil is a very unequal land, especially when it, uh, country, especially when it comes to land distribution. And they were really fighting hard for land reform. If we talk about land reform nowadays, people will jump that high. I know, uh, whatever, we are talking about about this particular situation here. And they had a lot of activism uh, around issues that are important for them, like unequal income distribution. They were fighting against this, racism, sexism, uh, and also the media monopolies. You can kind of see which color they are looking uh, at. And at the end, they wanted to have a self-sustainable way of uh, existing. Uh, and here I will show you 10 pictures, three seconds, each one of them, about the fight that the movement fought in the 80s and early 90s. Uh. 
Those pictures are from this fantastic book of Sebastian Salgado. You can find it. It's a big book, amazing, fantastic gift. So, and then farmers started to get land. The agrarian reform started to happen. But despite getting land, uh, they were still in this poverty trap. They were unable to survive on the land. After a few years, they had to leave because they would not be able to survive. Huh? They had no technical assistance, no training, no credit. And they were using exactly the same cultivation methods that led them to this poverty situation. Monocultures, they wanted to grow soybean, to export, like exactly the kind of crop that you, you are not supposed to grow because you, okay, the margins are too small. Right? So then in the early 2000s, they finally realized, okay, we have to change the way that we do our work. Uh, and then what they did, okay, they started to work with the agricultural approaches. Uh, so not only the, part, uh, the, the agricultural approaches at field level, they went beyond, and I'm coming to the food system soon. But then they started to establish partnership with universities. They started to create post-secondary schools. Like, how come that they created schools? Well, this is a movement with 1.5 million people. They have enough people to, to establish schools. And they, they also started to make pressure, really political pressure, so that they could have technical assistance. It's very important, this. Credit lines. They started to create cooperatives to process the agricultural products that they had. Milk, soybean, meat, a lot of other products, wine. Uh, access to institutional market, we will come to this very, uh, very soon, and also reaching out to consumers in urban areas, because they realize that, okay, agriculture, the production part is very important, but we have to look to the bigger picture. It's a systems perspective. And then they wanted to reach consumers that were aware of the production systems and probably willing to pay a little bit more, but not really much more. It was not a niche thing. They were not selling into these organic channels. They just wanted people that recognized their value and maybe could support them a little bit more. And obviously, research had to follow this. We from the universities, we had to work on that uh, researching in different aspects. It's much more applied research, it's not basic research. Uh, but very needed and lacking. And this is lacking till nowadays. Uh. So, uh, I believe that there are very uh, important aspects, and, and, and li like us too, like we, we need to have three very strong legs to, to keep something standing. And like one of them was the organization of the social movements. It can be a huge cooperative, it can be 10 families together. They had technical assistance, so advisory service, suitable for their reality. And not someone that came, okay, now you have to buy the largest tractor and you have to use this genotype of, of soybean, whatever. No, they need something more adequate for that. Uh, uh, and then, obviously, research and education. They need to have research and knowledge designed, developed for this kind of agriculture and in a coexistence system. Uh, actually, uh, this is me 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and a very important game changer was also when they were able to reach institutional markets. Eh? And last year it, it became a big thing, like, okay, apparently that they had the feeling that they have discovered the wheel. No, like, <laughs> but, but, but so the, the public procurement was always there, was always a very effective tool, but it was not being properly used. In Europe, it can also be used. There are some differences. But it's okay, it's still a very important tool. Uh, very important, uh, when we talk about agroecology, we talk about principles. We are not talking about guidelines and principles. Thank you very much. And there is a lot of scientific literature that you can find. What they are now going, uh, doing is that they have a lot of different value chains for different products all around the country. Uh, and, and when they have those value chains, it's not only the production, it's production until the consumer. Uh, and this is an ongoing thing. They have 185 cooperatives. Uh, you, you can read this later on. But important, 70,000 families are still waiting to get land. And I don't know if they will get land. Uh -huh. uh, oh, yeah, uh, they are also in, to not say that they are in a very socialistic or communistic fashion, they are uh, getting money from the financial market too, as credit. Uh, so they are playing around uh, using everything that they can. And they are working with agroecology, which is actually a bunch of different things. And here is the history of, or, or of agroecology. It's important for the Alnard students, but uh, we can talk about this later on. Uh, I'm coming to an end. Agroecology is based on principles. This is my last slide. <laughs> 
And it's very important, and I stress the word principles up there. Principles, not guidelines. And we have principles that are uh, important at field farm level and the other ones that are much more at the food system level. And those are the principles that movements like this landless workers movement, but a lot of other social movements that are active in, in South America, but also in other parts of the world, are starting to use. And they don't have to apply everything at once. They can start in a kind of transition way, like we start to, to work with the things that we can, and as we learn, and as, this, as the system develops, then we use more uh, of those things. And just to finish with this picture here, even during the harsh times of, the, uh, uh, of COVID, they were able to produce food, and because the institutional markets were closed, they were giving the food for free or, or very low cost to uh, favelas and others, uh, like people in need around the cities. So uh, it's a very successful example. It, it cannot and it should not be translated ipsis literis. There is no transparency. I, hate, I don't like the word transference of technology no, because it, it will not work. But it's important to learn from the examples, find out the patterns and get the principles and see how can we work with those things locally. Okay, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Time. I was just warning, we're going to be talking yet. But so um, there was so much that Marcus did not have time to say. So now you can ask him some of the questions. Why don't we get the picture of the 13 principles back? Because I think this is very key. Uh, because they, they were kind of defined 2019. And since then, a lot of uh, um, uh, what I say. At that time, there were like four big funders in the world or supporting um, supporting agroecology approaches or giving like Switzerland and but now with the principles in place so people kind of understand a little bit more what what is it and that it's not the same everywhere and you, you can take there is also now coming up ways of funding these systems and um, so there are now a system for funding it. So an agroecology, can you, can you say something about that, uh, Marcus, yeah. about that uh, progress? Yeah, so agroecology was being accused of not being very clear and no one knew about it. And then two major actions from the high level panel of experts from the UN and the FAO, they kind of organize some definitions. Then those are the 13 principles and FAO has the 10 elements. Yeah. So, and then nowadays we have the agroecology coalition, the TPP organics and so on. Uh, even the EU funding scheme is now looking. Last year, two years ago, they di directed 300 million euros for research in, in, into agroecology. Uh, so those are some actions that are going on here. There is a lot of discussion, that they call the risk of co-optation. So uh, a few years ago, Bayer tried to start to uh, use the word agroecology. Uh, yeah, so they, they can try. Um, but so there are funding schemes for this kind of thing because there is clarity now about the food system. Before there were no concepts in place. Now we have a framework to work on. It's equivalent to SDGs. Uh, okay, I don't know, there are questions. Yeah, we can have one question, yes, please. Yes, indeed, here. <laughs> it is there. No? But, 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 but again, no, wait, let's point. have a question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's this the, that words matters, and sometimes they are hijacked by the big corporates, and sometimes they become something that is a real movement. Uh, and um, how, how, when it comes to the, the agroecology word, how does how, how the differentiation? What are the strengths of agroecology compared to regenerative agriculture, for example? Okay, regenerative agriculture is much more at field farm level, while agroecology goes beyond. Agroecology is really kind of the food system perspective. We take into account all those very important concepts of regenerative agriculture, and they are around here recycling, soil health, biodiversity, synergy. Those uh, elements of regenerative agriculture are here. But agroecology wants to also go beyond. Uh, so they are included, they are recognized and valued, acknowledged. Uh, but the difference when we look at the definition of regenerative agriculture and agroecology is that agroecology goes beyond, wants to reach the whole food system. It's very ambitious.
Because, for example, it's a big investment con conference in Brussels in a few weeks that is called Regenerative Food Systems Investment. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's pretty much heading for the same goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, di using different terms for the same thing or very similar. But there is a lot of cooperation going on. Yeah, I think it's um, a very timely. Uh, agroecology has been uh, used and uh, applied in different ways, but now we can see this, uh, the 13 principles and the uh, uh, 10 uh, what elements. elements. Uh, so there is some more definition and that will facilitate for NGOs and organizations also applying because they are working with these kind of systems, they are more holistic, uh, they can apply funding now because there are elements that they can apply in their applications. Yeah. Uh, now, this is what we say from here. Now we have to continue with the speakers, but this is a day where you will discuss this bilaterally after in groups. And you have Marcus here all day, I hope. Yeah, so I hope you can have all the questions to him. And thank you, Marcus, for a wonderful presentation yeah, and keeping the time. Wow, we give applause to Marcus. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, we will have a lot of time to interact with Marcos during the day. And now it's my pleasure uh, to welcome Romina uh, in Rome. Good morning, Romina. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm very well, thank you. And you? Yeah, we are fine. And it's so good to have you here and we can see you very well uh, on streaming. And I hope you can hear us and we'll be able to interact. So. <clears throat> It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Romina Cavatassi, lead economist with the Research and Impact Assessment Division in IFAD. And uh, Romina <coughs> has recently been co-authoring a very important report on gender in the agriculture as well. And she was also one of the lead author for the Rural Development Report that IFAD launches. Is it every second? Second year, third year, is it? Uh, third year. Yeah. And those, I must say that this report has really inspired our work. It helped us to organize our how we would like to work. And uh, uh, we have asked you to come here to talk a little bit about um, what we call the <coughs> uh, the, uh, <coughs> the midstream business. What is this? And uh, Romina, take your time and uh, please go. Thank you very much, Madeleine. Uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I feel honored to, to be with you, although virtually I would have liked to be in Stockholm, but uh, technology can help sometimes. And um, yes, so starting from where we met last time, where uh, we discussed about the key insights of the Rural Development Report that was launched in the, um, 2021 uh, from the perspective of the rural poor. Um, today, we will restart from there, but focusing on the local midstream business and uh, what does it take to enable that sector to, to trigger development that is fair and just. And this is because what drove the uh, the whole food system uh, dialogue, and in particular for us, the Rural Development Report in 2021, was the realization that something is not working when you see that uh, those that feed us go hungry, uh, that there is, despite a huge increase in uh, uh, food production, there is still um, a lot of undernourishment, uh, but also obesity and malnutrition. And last but certainly not least, uh, there is a huge uh, impact coming from the food system on the environment, both in terms of uh, degradation as well as in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we had to address this, um, this issue and we still do in terms of uh, uh, transforming it in a better way. And um, this year, for example, um, the uh, state of food and agriculture uh, agriculture that has been released by FAO well last year because we are in January so this was released uh, in November 2023 um, uh, focusing on the hidden cost of food of food uh, especially uh, on from the environmental and social point of view and it has been estimated using a true cost accounting that the agri food system uh, hidden cost the total cost is about 
10 trillion uh, in 2020 dollars value. Most of this cost uh, is the, 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 the low income countries are those that bear most of these costs um, uh, relative to the national income. And considering that inequalities have been rising uh, within each country, then uh, we can also say that uh, low income countries bear most of this cost, but within uh, every country, inequalities are also those that drive the um, those that bear the cost so this is the poorest and the most marginalized and by the most marginalized we mean uh women uh, and we mean the rural poor in particular and also elderly and uh, and young people so the two tails of the population distribution uh, of course, chronically undernourishment is rising, and this is again mostly um, on the shoulders of uh, of the poor people and women and youth. Um, and the rural um, people um, are those are still key um, to uh, suffer these costs, but they are also key to solve and help address the solutions. This is first and foremost because there are many. There are between 3.2 billion uh, living in rural areas and 3.4 billion in the latest estimates uh, living in rural areas of low and middle income countries. More than 500 million of these work on less than two hectares of land for a total farmland of about 11%. And still, farming this small total farmland with a very small amount per capita, they are able to produce about 31% of our food. So they are still very key, and it's fair and just to address the, the cost that they bear. Now, another fact that we need to consider, and that I know you will be talking a lot about in the rest of the day, is the urbanization that is increasing and driving changes in the agri-food system across the rural urban continuum. So it's uh, of utmost importance to focus on the peri-urban areas that connect dots between the rural and urban areas. This of course um, presents a number of challenges, including the higher use of uh, ultra-processed food, which is not good for uh, nutrition, it leads to malnutrition. The risk of excluding even further small farmers from former value chain and increasing loss of arable land uh, going to urbanization where land is already shrinking a lot. But it also offers opportunities uh, through longer and more formal and complex value chain. So we need to make sure that everyone is included in those value chain. It offers opportunities for uh, employment, um, both self-employment and uh, wage employment. And this is particularly relevant for those that we said are more marginalized, so women and youth. Um, so if we want to focus now on investing in this agri-food midstream, which is everything that goes from the farm gate up to the consumer, so the processing, storing, trading and distribution, um, what does it take to, to make it work? First, we need to start from some facts again, uh, starting from uh, the fact that uh, women, um, it, the rural employment is, so first of all, one fourth of rural employment is uh, for um, the small scale producers that depend on them. This is particularly true for women um, who depend uh, more than men on agri-food system, up to 36% of them. This is the latest estimates from the status of food uh, uh, of rural women in agri-food system that was released by FAO uh, last year, and I was also part of that team. And um, yet the returns they uh, get from uh, from the employment are often lower than what men get. So this gap still needs to be filled and providing women with equal access to resources, services, technologies, training, but also finance can help close that gap. This is likewise true for youth, and even more so, it's uh, worrisome to think the, about the unemployment rate of youth, uh, which stands at about 15.6%, uh, which is triple than the adult rate. There is an increasing uh, phenomenon connected to the youth that are not in education, employment or training, the so-called NEET. 
but that's, this is particularly worrisome in uh, Africa, where 25 million young people enter the labor market annually. Uh, and it, it is expected that by 2030, about uh, 300 75 million youth will enter the labor force. So this is an enormous challenge uh, which cannot be addressed only uh, through agriculture. Agriculture still remain very important, but it's not the only solution. It's important also to uh, develop what, what's next after production. Uh, and so that is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. Uh, how how is this an opportunity? Well, it's because we can involve the local population, diversify uh, the the quality and the typology of food, connect the small farmers living in rural areas to the market, uh, especially acting on the peri-urban uh, areas, generating employment, but also, for example, using uh, new technologies, digitization, and uh, addressing the food safety and standard using um, uh, also the, the circular approach and sustainable food system. Um, the challenges are there, uh, which requires reducing the transaction costs, for example. Uh, it requires making sure that these long value chains are that are often ineffective, complex and informal. Uh, they become with clear rules and transparent um, and uh, including the employment opportunities uh, that are still very informal. Um, so what do we need to address these challenges? Uh, certainly, um, we need infrastructure, which is um, still lacking, but also education and access to finance. These are, in fact, uh, when we did the RDR and still very valid now, what are the barriers that uh, people face in accessing uh, the agri-food value chain? Capacity constraints in, in non-inclusive, uh, trust and reciprocity in the market uh, system, high transaction cost and very low market power and financial constraints. So starting from these gaps and barriers, we can act to make sure that the um, midstream is a, a, catalyst, a catalyzer of uh, development. Um, so to unlock the potential, already mentioned, we need um, these incubators and investments. Um, and one such example is being um, implemented by IFAD in collaboration with the government of Germany and, and Visa Foundation is um, in, an integrated agribusiness hub, which works um, in a way to first assess what, the, what are the needs um, in the local areas, in the urban and uh, peri-urban areas, what is needed, what is missing to complete the value chain that uh, it's not only agricultural production, but also transformation, um, lengthening the life of uh, agricultural produce through processing, through cooling facilities, uh, through different types of uh, um, processing that reduce the waste and, uh, if possible, nail the waste and the loss of, uh, of food. And, and so all these things need to be addressed, creating the vocational uh, skills and expertise, uh, the know-how, providing the technology and infrastructure that is needed, but also um, so, uh, ensuring access to finance, which is often not there. So, for example, in that sense, um, IFAD, uh, through IFAD programming, uh, youth and women can uh, um, apply to these matching grants and get access to finance and uh, start up uh, new uh, micro and small businesses, but also be employed thanks to the uh, educational training that they receive. Uh, there are already some good examples in a number of countries, including uh, Kenya, for example, with the dairy production, but also in the Comoros Island, um, in, in the, uh, in the uh, Nigeria, and uh, currently a new project is being developed in uh, Cameroon. And there will be hopefully more of these. We're learning also from the mistakes of what was missing in the previous examples of these types of investments, and uh, now uh, also looking at what were the startup that declined over time and focusing on what were the mechanisms that ensured some of these startups to keep up and to generate more employment and more opportunities. 
so starting from there, we are working on a number of new um, agribusinesses, and we hope that uh, that will work um, will work well. Uh, my time is over, but I'm done, and I'm happy to answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Romina. Uh, this was great. Uh, I think it was a very good overview and also showing a good introduction to speakers that will come also up on the stage to present some of this work. So, um, uh, Romina, I wonder if there is someone in the audience that have a question for you that you would like to address? Yes. We have, um, please, Eugene, introduce yourself for Romina. You can look at her here because then she will see oh, you better. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you. Thank. So as she has said, I'm Eugene. My name is Eugene. I'm from Kenya. So when it comes to food security, like one of the, when I started thinking about it, one of the things I thought about quickly was as a leader, you, you should research on the amount of food your country needs and work to provide with the farmers that amount of food. But even in your research, you realize very quickly that in a country, sometimes the problem is not food supply, but the cost of the food to the citizens in that country. Like in my country, for example, we have, like in the last year, we have like food being produced by farmers going to waste because people can't afford to buy from the local farmers. So we have to import cheaper food from other countries like Ukraine in terms of rice and Russia and things like that. So my question to you is like, what steps can you take to make sure that the foods produced locally are affordable enough to compete with the others and they are affordable to the citizens within the country? I just, in terms, cause he mentioned Marcos over here, he mentioned something that the, their project did that made like economically food more affordable during COVID time. So I was wondering like some of those methods they used to make it possible. I'm sorry if it's, if it's, it's okay. taken I a mean, lot of Rumi, time. You got the question. Yeah, yeah. I did. Uh, it's not an easy question because uh, there are a number of things that are um, also related to the trade uh, policies that to the chains uh, that work in uh, given countries and to the contractual power. Uh, for example, there, were, there are cases in which, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's cheaper to import from outside than, than uh, to produce internally. Uh, so th there are very many uh, forces that play a different role, and there are different things that can be done. Certainly acting on the policies and how um, it's important to provide examples of uh, good practices and, and focus on policy advocacy, uh, also for the investing more in the midstream in every country and not, uh, and not only importing. Uh, having said that, it's also important that trade is an important instrument that we should keep using um, uh, although that should be more focusing on what are the strengths of each countries uh, to import and export. So it's, it, it shouldn't only be to import or to export, but it, it should be uh, both directions. And in terms of the food waste, a lot can be done, uh, even sometimes with uh, very small um, types, very easy types of intervention. For example, um, there are cases in which uh, the providing some communities with uh, cooling facilities can lengthen the life of the project. Uh, there are nowadays more and more technologies available to make sure that nothing is wasted, uh, everything is recycled. So from uh, uh, food that is very perishable, uh, the transformation can guarantee that the life of that agricultural produce is uh, much longer. And so that is what uh, we should invest on in every country with the support of uh, the political environment of, uh, of each country, but also with guaranteeing access to finance. Because um, for a number of these um, small entrepreneurs, um, it's very difficult to start anything and to keep uh, being alive in the market because finance is uh, often inaccessible or very costly. 
So at least accompanying them in the in the beginning of of the process, and uh, guaranteeing also that over time, for example, youth entrepreneurs are uh, are kept or those that are employed are kept also through uh, subsidies that can be offered um, to hire young people or women vis-a-vis -vis adult uh, and other typology of uh, of employed. Um, of people. Yeah, thank you, Romina, and thank you, Jean, for the question. And I think we have some more presenters, so we will have to say farewell for now, Romina. We hope to see you in Stockholm. We know you are working on very exciting uh, reports that will be launched during spring. So um, um, keep following the Siani webpage and uh, uh, and also our seminars, and I hope you, really, Romina, you can come back. We're looking forward to have you back again. Uh, thank yeah, you. with that, thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye. So. <clears throat> I think Romina mentioned very well how important it is to engage young people and also how to use a broader um, uh, scope of technologies, not least communication. And uh, the next presentation is um, how you can mobilize young people and also strengthening the local and peri-urban food system. And I'm very happy to introduce to you Maria Sachs, who is the founder of Voices for Change, where Eugene is working as well. So so, Maria, please uh, come forward. Thank you. Good morning, um, and thank you so much. Um, yes, I'm going to speak uh, under the theme of mobilizing youth and strengthening local peri-urban food systems. And as Marlene is saying, I'm Maria Sachs, and I'm the founder of the uh, foundation Voices for Change. And I'm going to introduce to you this morning uh, our Growth for Change initiative um, in Kenya. Um, we work in, uh, it's powered by Voices for Change and Growth for Change operates in low income areas, uh, urban and peri-urban areas and primarily informal settlements in Nairobi. Um, and as you may know, and for those of you visiting Nairobi, uh, as in most African cities, Nairobi is highly segregated. So you have very developed um, neighborhoods, uh, but you also have a lot of um, informal settlements. And most people actually live in the informal settlements. Um, and uh, so we work in the Eastlands. Um, it's about 40 minutes outside of the city center um, of Nairobi. Uh, we started working there amplifying voices um, among youth and uh, we kept hearing um, stories about how hunger is it was pushes young men into crime. And we kept on hearing stories about how women are trading their bodies for food. And we kept hearing stories about single mothers um, feeding their children of food waste that they have found in a nearby dump site. And we observed how people were growing food, vegetables, just next to the dump site in very polluted soil. Um, so this brutal reality um, is what made us uh, take the decision to introduce hydroponic technologies uh, into these um, communities. So why hydroponics? The main reasons for that is that people are living very squeezed. Um, there is a scarcity of space um, and hydroponics doesn't require that much of space. Uh, everyone has a wall, so you can build also the system vertical and so on. There is also scarcity of water, um, so preferably there should be a closed system because there is no room to waste water. Um, so that was another reason. Um, also, as I said, the, the soil is highly polluted because there is a lot of waste. Uh, Dandora, that is one of the communities, is the location of the biggest uh, dump site in Nairobi, Kenya. I think it's even in the region. Um, so these are reasons. And the fourth reason is that we came to learn that young people are really keen um, to pick up new knowledge, very talented, very street smart very ready to adopt. Thank you. <laughs> New technologies and to learn things. 
Um, so we felt like it's uh, they are they are technology is something that attracts. I want to give you a few examples for projects and groups that we are working with. Uh, this is one example. Uh, it's Comgreen Solutions. It's a community-based organization. Uh, it consists of reformists, meaning former criminals, and sex workers uh, that have come together to support each other. Uh, they have a highly environmental uh, profile. They are greening spaces, they are planting trees, they are cleaning rivers and so forth. Um, and they're also running various of income generating projects. So we, together with them, uh, we set up, they had a bit of space because they have reclaimed some of the public land in this area. Um, so we set up a, hi, a, a horizontal hydroponic system together with them. Uh, we have also managed to install solar so they can run this system um, totally off grid, uh, which, which helps. Um, they are growing mainly African indigenous leafy vegetables. So it's kale, it's spinach, it's African nightshade. Um, and they use the produced, uh, produce in their feeding program for children. They are also uh, using it for their members and, and the surplus, if possible, they are selling it uh, to the uh, people in the communities. Another example is Charmy Organics. It's a small micro business um, run by two university students. Um, so they already had a fish pond when we came across them. And they had tried hydroponics, but their system had broken down. So we helped them to um, set up a, a, a more advanced system, a vertical system. And we have also installed solar. Um, in their small farm. And thanks to their uh, academic studies, we managed to build a bit on their knowledge and now we involve them as master trainers for other groups. And the last example I want to give you is our most recent partner. It's a Gero Feminist Network that is a women-led uh, community-based organization. We were very keen to engage more women and to get their feedback whether hydroponics is something that serves women and women groups. Um, so we have this learning project together in Exchange. Um, and they, this organization has a clear feminist profile, which we see as an advantage. They are engaged in ecofeminism uh, and conversation around that, um, which, which is an advantage. Um, and this program coincided also with the pandemic. It was during the same time where the food insecurity in these communities was very severe. Um, so by after piloting these uh, different projects, we have now grown, Growth for Change has kind of grown and developed into a holistic program. Um, and today we say that we are uniting change makers to get to engineer innovative solutions for urban transformation. So the program, as for today, goes beyond just farming. So we try to also introduce other type of technology solutions that can serve these um, communities and make them more resilient, more inclusive, um, help adopting for climate change, mitigate climate change. And our change theory is really to build ecosystems in these communities by connecting people, by connecting groups, connecting producers, farmers, researchers, uh, and so on, and to make us not needed. Uh, this approach works really well. Uh, we have come to realize that it is not funding necessarily that makes the difference. It's for people to have that trust that there is somewhere to turn for support, knowledge, exchange, and that kind of support system, local support system, is very important. Uh, we can call it food system, we can call it ecosystem support system, but the importance is that how people are interlinked and co to create that kind of uh, codependence somehow and, and regain that spirit, community spirit. Um, so we try to help the groups to define their expertise, their, pa their, their pa passion. Uh, one group could be good in producing seedlings, then they sell the seedlings to someone else. One creates uh, and designs the systems, they help the other groups to, to get systems and so on. So we're trying to interlink uh, these different uh, groups to each other. 
And in summary, this is how we make a difference. So we have this approach of supporting community-driven small-scale interventions. Uh, we call it urban acupuncture. It's an established concept uh, in how you can uh, inject energy where it's needed uh, with a philosophy to, philosophy to transform the larger urban space. Uh, we have an entrepreneurial approach, meaning we try to encourage creative ideas and encourage the groups to um, look at their systems as small business model, collect data and make sure they can cover, cover their own costs um, to avoid dependency from external uh, support. We try, as I said, uh, bringing in technologies. We collaborate with different techies um, to see how we can adopt uh, technology to the local conditions. And as I said, we also trying to facilitate as much as possible the peer-to-peer -peer support uh, in the local communities. And finally, we are, as my colleague here, Arjun, was uh, raising, uh, also amplifying voices and spark conversations around food justice and food and the importance of food politics, how things are interlinked, uh, and that poverty and hunger are man-made, which I think is a very important thing to remember. So that we do through various of creative ways. We use music, rap music, music videos, um, various forms of conversations, community theatre, videography and so forth to have these uh, conversations. And uh, that was all. Thank you so much. I invite you to follow us on social media and uh, reach out if you share the mission to make this type of urban communities more inclusive and resilient. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. It has been um, so interesting to follow this work because we have been in dialogue before the pandemic even, I think. Uh, and it's amazing to see what has been uh, created and how important the connections and networks are and how we can amplify voices. Is, are there any questions to Maria or uh, here now? This. This one. There is the mic, and I'm back again. Mm. Uh, Josta, we know each other as least before Elm International. <clears throat> We're working with a uh, student campus network of 30,000 people, pan-European, the Swahili countries and so on. Um, they are very much interested in these things, creating livelihoods, as we call them. Uh, my question is, where do you find the techies? Are they local techies, or the techies from all over the world? And, and how could we connect mm. those people with your people? Mm. That's my question. Yes, they can be based anywhere. We are very open um, to collaborate. So we tried, it could be based in Sweden, it could be locally. But uh, the, the key here is the ghetto engineering. And I, someone was saying that in the morning also, now previously, that the importance of adopting to the local conditions. The students I talk about, they are from Africa, not yeah. from Sweden. Yeah. Right, brilliant. So we are very let's open. Let's have a chat. Yes. Yep. Good. Thank you. This is what this meeting is all about, connecting and sharing and uh, starting new collaboration. Perfect. Perfect. So now over to Alice. We are a little bit late, but uh, uh, I'm sure Alice, my colleague from Ziani, very efficient. And she will talk a little bit about individuals and agents in this system and how we can amplify individual voices as well. Alice, young voices. Young voices, that's correct. Hi everyone, um, I'm Alice Tunfjord and I'm an associate at Siani. And before I go into the young voices amplification, um, I would like to remind you about our annual survey 2023. Because my role in Siani is partly to make sure that we improve the work that we're doing, that we are conducting the activities that we plan to do and that we are contributing to change that our members are asking for. And we also want to learn from the activities that we do. So please, if you have time throughout the day, you can scan uh, the QR codes that are on your tables during lunch or the break uh, to provide feedback for, for the work that we did in Siani 2023, but also to give your input on how we can improve our work in 2024. And for those online, you can scan the QR code that's on the screen. With that said, I would like to move on to our next speaker. 
Because as Madeleine said, we've been working a lot with empowering voices in our network uh, for them to share their perspectives. And especially during the last couple of years, we have done, we are focusing a lot on youth and young people. And one of these people are Naul Adungna from Beta Blockers. And Noel is co-founder of Beta Blockers, which is a company in Ethiopia who has developed a, local, a recipe uh, for nutritious crackers and biscuits based on local crops. And we first came in touch with Noel in our network in 2022 when he was presenting his work at our event in Almedalen. And we have been in touch with him since, and he also joined us in our um, regional network meeting in Nairobi uh, in November last year. And unfortunately, he could not join us live today, but he has kindly recorded a video for us that we will see, where he talks about the role of networks, especially for young people and small businesses. So welcome on stage, uh, or on video, on screen, <laughs> Noel Adungna from Vieta Blokish. Hi, my name is Kiru Belengedorg from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. I am the co-founder and CEO of Beta Blockers PLC. My name is Naula Dunya and I am the Chief Business Development Officer at the Beta Blockers. Beta Blockers PLC, established in 2020 by a passionate team of four young pharmacists, is a proud alumni of the 2021 WFP Next Gen Innovators Program. Our mission is centered on creating affordable and nutritious products from locally sourced crops. We aim to combat malnutrition, a significant issue affecting 45% of the Ethiopian population, especially children. After the Next Gen program and some micro grants, we officially launched our products in May 2022 as a legally registered business. We also managed to expand into producing bakery products. By August 2023, we've reached to over 500 children, served 4,500 average monthly customers, and provided jobs for four employees. At Beta Blockers, we believe innovation is the cornerstone of food security, and young people like ourselves hold the key to unlocking. Currently, we are operating in the capital city Addis Ababa in the neighboring town called Burayu, with the promise of scaling to other cities soon. Our products are affordable to parents and accessible to children. We believe that this is important because this group are disproportionately affected by climate change, poverty, in skyrocketing inflation. We actively inspire school youth to embrace innovation and become agents of change in the food system. And recently, we had the incredible honor of representing beta blockers at the Yalta Youth in Agroecology Learning Business Track Africa Initiative Regional Summit in Uganda. We shared our journey and insights on integrating agroecological principles into food processing for the benefit of our community. Furthermore, we showcased our innovative products at the first Agroecological Market System Expo 2022 and advocated for greater youth engagement in agricultural and related fields, both at the event and on local television. This experience culminated in the pivotal moment at the Swedish Political Week where we were invited to share our experience and expertise on youth engagement in inclusive and sustainable food system. This opportunity broadened our international perspective and led us to the Siani Regional Meeting. At the Siani Meeting, we not only showcased our product and future plans but also forged valuable connections with professionals from diverse sectors, notably sharing our participation with the local authorities positioned beta blockers as a model startup with potential for land access and credit, propelling our development further. Siani's role in our growth has been invaluable and we are deeply grateful for their partnership. We remain committed to this collaboration, working together to build a better food system across the region. Thank you very much. Yeah. So. Thank you very much.
very much, Naul. I'm not sure if you are uh, uh, seeing us now. We are streaming this, but this was not the intention from the beginning, but there are people li watching us in the streaming. But now we will close the streaming uh, for uh, um, for the roundtable dialogues, but I kindly ask you all behind, uh, behind your screens to join us again uh, at two o'clock when we start the next session with very interesting speakers. Uh, um, so don't miss that because we will continue these interesting uh, uh, presentations. So now you have seen like a chain of how you can inspire and work within the food system, the agents of change and how we can support them in networks. And uh, we have now organized round table discussions. And uh, you have at each table a moderator. So we, can you raise your hand, the moderators?